Alhamdulillah, he woke up. Was salatu was salamu ala ibadi hilati nastafa. Khususan ala of Delhi him wa khatam in Nabiin, Muhammadin al Amin, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Waba. Fa'audu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim Bismillahirrahmanirrahim Wa nazzalna alayka al-kitaba tibiyannan likulli shay Wa hudan wa rahmatan wa bushra lil-muslimin Sadaqallahu al-azim Surah al-Nahl of the Qur'an and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala declares, and we sent down the book, yani the Qur'an on thee, O Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam, that this Qur'an might explain all things. And therefore that this Qur'an might explain that strange age when the Khilafah, the state and government in Islam, disappears. And it is replaced by something else. The modern secular state, the, re the Commonwealth of Australia. This Quran will explain that strange age when the Khilafah disappears. And for a period of time there is no Khilafah. And then the Khilafah comes back one more time. And in this Quran, there is guidance how to respond to that strange age when the Khilafah will no longer be there. That explanation and that guidance have come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as an act of Rahmah. And for those who search and find it and, and accept it and embrace it, Bushra lahum, good news and glad tidings for such people. They will understand the world in that age which others cannot, and they will respond to it correctly, while others will not. We praise Allah and we glorify Him this night. And we beseech Him most humbly for His guidance and for His blessings and for His protection. As we attempt to address the subject, Imam al-Mahdi and the return of the Khilafah. And we pray for peace and for blessings on all his noble messengers. And in particular on the last of them all, the blessed Prophet Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam. Before we begin, let us remind you of the announcement which is just made. By far the most important topic that I'll be addressing on this visit of mine, who knows if it's going to be the last is the subject Islam and the International Monetary System, not International Monetary Fund. The subject of Islam and money. What is money in Islam? What is money in the Quran? What is money in the Sunnah? You'll be surprised. <laughs> that lecture which was supposed to take place tomorrow night had to be rescheduled because the hall was too small so it is now rescheduled for next wednesday no longer at black town is it no longer at black town but now at the liverpool gyyc whatever it is you know what i'm talking about sheikh sheikh faiz who brought a lovely Lebanese breakfast for me this morning and I sat down with Sheikh Faiz and I had breakfast this morning. Alhamdulillah, may Allah bless him. So that lecture is now next Wednesday, inshallah, at Liverpool. But next Monday, inshallah, we'll have a repeat of Jerusalem in the Quran, which now I have the book. When I came last December, I didn't have the book. Now we have the book. And in this subject, Jerusalem in the Quran, I'm going to give you the whole subject. I'm not going to hold back anything. <laughs> so make sure you sleep in the afternoon before you come. <laughs> Let us now begin in Allah's blessed name. What is 
the Khilafah. The Khilafah is state and government in Islam. What is Islam? The definition of Islam is submission to Allah. What is submission to Allah? Submission to Allah is submission to Allah as Al-Malik. In some translations in English you find Malik as king. No. We don't want that translation tonight. We're dealing with political terminology here tonight. And so Al-Malik is the sovereign. Now that's a word you'll understand. Sovereign. Lahul Mulk, sovereignty belongs to him. And so, to submit to Allah in Islam is to submit to Allah as sovereign, who possesses sovereignty. To submit to anyone else as sovereign, to declare that anyone else possesses sovereignty is to say goodbye to Allah. Did you hear that? To submit to Allah is to submit to Allah as Al-Akbar. And he reminds you that he is Al-Akbar. Because every time you perform Salat, you cannot move in Salat without Allahu Akbar. Al-Akbar is the one who has supreme authority. And so the Khilafah is a state and government which submits to Allah's authority as supreme. For a Muslim to submit to anyone else and recognize his authority as supreme is to say goodbye to Allahu Akbar. Islam is to submit to Allah as Al-Hakam. The 99 names, this is one of them. Al-Hakam is the lawgiver who not only gives the law, but his law is the supreme law. And when he makes something haram, it must be enforced as haram. And when he makes something halal, it must be enforced as halal. And so anyone who submits to any law other than Allah's law as the supreme law has said goodbye to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as al-hakam. This is called, in the political terminology of Islam, this is called shirk. When Fir'aun declared, and of course everyone knows what Fir'aun said, ana rabbukumul a'la, I am the one who is sovereign. <laughs> I possess sovereignty. That was shirk. When he declared, Ana rabbukumul a'la, I am the one who possesses supreme authority. That was shirk. When he declared, Ana rabbukumul a'la, my law is the supreme law in the land of Egypt. That was shirk. And Allah punished him with terrible punishment for his shirk. This then was the Khilafah, a system of state and government in which Muslims could submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as al-Malik, as al-Akbar, as al-Hakam. 
The Khilafah was destroyed. Who destroyed it? Why did they destroy it? How did they destroy it? When did they destroy it? What did they replace it with? With what was it replaced? And what is its destiny? These are awesomely important questions which very few can answer today. There is a book outside which was not written as an attack on a religious movement, the Wahhabi movement, no. It is entitled The Caliphate, the Hejaz, and the Saudi Wahhabi nation state. It's outside. And it answers all of these questions. Now then, let us begin the lecture as to who destroyed the Khilafah and why did they destroy it and how did they destroy it. When you read this book, Jerusalem in the Quran, and when you listen to the lecture next Monday, then you'll know that the Jews had in their heart, as they still have to this day, this conviction that it is their destiny. Even after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had expelled them from the Holy Land, even after they had lived in the wilderness for 2,000 years, it is the conviction in the heart of the Jews that it is their destiny to liberate the Holy Land of non-Jewish rule. To return to the Holy Land not as tourists, no. To return to the Holy Land to reclaim it as their own. For 2,000 years the Jews had this conviction in their heart that one day this will happen. To restore in the Holy Land the state of Israel of Nabi Da'ud alayhi salam and Nabi Suleiman alayhi salam. And that the golden age will come back one more time. The golden age when that state of Israel of Nabi Da'ud alayhi salam and Nabi Suleiman alayhi salam was the ruling state in the world that that age will come back one more time. And so the state of Israel, when it is restored, will eventually become the ruling state in the world. This was the conviction of the Jews. You and I, from the Quran and from the Sunnah, from the Hadith of the Prophet we would know about the magnificent deception of Al-Masih al-Dajjal who liberates the Holy Land in 19, 19, 19, 19 liberates the Holy Land of non-Jewish rule who brings the Jews back to the Holy Land not as tourists but to reclaim it as their own between 1919 and 1948 who restores a state of Israel in the Holy Land in 1948 and convinces the one-eyed Jews that this is the Israel of Nabi Dawood al-Islam and Nabi Suleiman al-Islam but of course it is not, it is an imposter but they accept it and they embrace it and that this Israel is about to become the ruling state in the world replacing the United States of America those who differ with me, who say, well, we never read this in our books. Where did he get this from? This must be false. My answer to them is just wait and see. Just wait and see. If this is to be accomplished, and the golden age of the Jews is to return one more time, and they are to rule the world, how will they do it? They will need globalization to bring all of mankind together as one global society. And they need to demolish 
the Ottoman Islamic Empire, which stands in their way, and they will have to demolish the institution of the Khilafah, which is the head of Islam. If you can cut off the head, then you can paralyze the body. And so, the attack is now launched to cut off the head, the Khilafah. It begins as a philosophical attack, which we spoke of the, the, the first lecture here tonight. No, no, the one on alcohol. And that is that you use an, I'm going to use a long word now, you use an epistemology, that knowledge comes only from external observation and rational inquiry, to take mankind to materialism. But there is no reality beyond material reality. Hmm? And then you apply that to political thought. And so out of philosophical materialism emerges a new political philosophy. What does it say? Since there is no reality beyond material reality, we can no longer collectively recognize sovereignty up there, so sovereignty must now be relocated down here. The people are now sovereign, no longer the God of Ibrahim alayhi salam. And the people constitute the state, and they locate sovereignty in the state. So the state is now sovereign. This is a European creation. It didn't come out of the world of Islam. Oh, no. Not only is the state sovereign, but the authority of the state is supreme. And it is the state which now makes law. And the law of the state is the highest law, the supreme law. But more than that, the God of Abraham alayhi salam could make something haram. But we, the state, can change that and make it halal, meaning legalize it. If I am wrong, get up and correct me. Eh? Get up and correct me. We can change it and make it halal, meaning legalize it. And that is what Europe proceeded to do. Everything that Allah had made haram, they made it halal. There's <laughs> nothing left now. When they declared that sovereignty belonged to them, not to Allah, that was shirk. It was shirk for Fir'aun, it is shirk for them. When they declared that the authority of the state is supreme, that was shirk. When they declared in Articles 24 and 25 of the Charter of the United Nations Organization, which I believe the Republic of Iran has not read as yet. Uh, when they declared in Articles 24 and 25 of the Charter of the United Nations, which the Republic of Iran, oh sorry, sorry, the Islamic Republic of Iran has not as yet read, what they declare? That the authority of the Supreme Council of the United Nations. Is that what it's called? Security Council, sorry. Security Council. That the Security Council of the United Nations is vested with supreme authority in the world. In all matters pertaining to international peace and security, that was shirk. When they declared that the law of the secular state is the highest law, that was shirk. And when they declared halal what Allah made haram, meaning when they legalized what Allah made haram, that was shirk. Surah to Tawbah of the Quran, بَعَدْ أَعُوذُ بِاللَّهِ مِنَ الشَّيْطَانِ الرَّجِيمِ اِتَّخَذُوا أَخْبَارَهُمْ وَرُحْبَانَهُمْ أَرْبَابًا مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ They took their priests and their rabbis as arbab, 
lords and gods beside Allah. Wal Masih ibn Maryam, and they did the same thing with the Messiah, the son of Mary. وَمَا أُمِرُوا إِلَّا يَعْبُدُوا إِلَهًا وَاحِدٍ But they had not been commanded other than to worship one God. لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا هُوْ There is no God beside him. سُبْحَانَهُ Glory be to him. عَمَّا عَمَّا يُشْرِكُونَ Far removed is he from this act of shirk. Taking your priests and your rabbis as gods and lords beside Allah. Shirk, says Allah. A man came to the Prophet والسلام, and said, O Messenger of Allah, but the Christians do not worship their priests, and the Jews do not worship their rabbis. How could Allah say so? To which the Prophet والسلام, replied, and he said, Did they not make halal what Allah had made haram? That is their shirk. My question tonight, Lakemba, is this. If the priest and the rabbi make halal what Allah made haram, and that is shirk, then if the government does the same thing, would it not be shirk? You're very quiet tonight, aren't you, Lakemba? <laughs> yeah? And so, what Europe did is to launch the philosophical and political attack before the military attack. To produce that which can replace the Khilafah. And then they sent their agents, you remember Jassasa in the Tamimudari Hadith? They sent their spies to infiltrate Istanbul and to create what were called the Young Turks, the committee of whatever it was called, in whose group was located a man named Mustafa Kemal, and brainwashed them, brainwashed them into absorbing and imbibing and accepting the new political secularism which emerged out of Europe. Jazakallah. Jazakallah khair. Then came the actual military attack. In 1897, Europeans who dressed up themselves in the clothing of Jews, remember they are Europeans who are parading as Jews, okay? They're called European Jews, but they're essentially Europeans. Judaism is only a camouflage. These people established the Zionist movement. The, the stage was now set. The countdown has begun for the Jews to strike after waiting for almost 2,000 years they are now ready to strike to achieve their long held objective of bringing back the golden age centuries before this they had struck at Europe and over a period of almost three to four hundred years, they had transformed Europe from a civilization based on faith in Christianity to a new, essentially godless civilization. Hmm? Having done that, they are now ready to strike when they create the Zionist movement. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now unveils the mother of all signs for those who have eyes to see. But most of mankind have eyes. Most of mankind, they have eyes, but they don't see. They have ears, but they don't hear. They have hearts, but they don't understand. Allah says of such people, they're just like cattle. What is the sign? The sign is the recovery of the body of Fir'aun. Yes. 
We will deal with this subject, inshallah, on Monday night. The body of Fir'aun is rediscovered just about the time that the Zionist movement is established. At about the same time also, strange thing happens to the European Jew. He's not just making money through lending money on interest. No. The European Jew gets a windfall. A massive amount of wealth now comes his way. How? The hadith was that the earth would yield up its treasures to Dajjal. A child was playing, a black child, was playing in a village in South Africa. And this child, in the middle of the 19th century, found a big stone, glittering stone. Child took it home, showed it to the parents. Parents took it to the chief of the tribe. Chief of the tribe took it to the white commissioner. White commissioner sent it to Cape Town or Johannesburg, one of these places, to have it examined. And promptly came the reply that this was a huge diamond. You think that happened by accident? You're living in Disneyland. No, the stage was now set when that diamond was discovered. Because now we know where the diamonds are located. By this time, Britain, the scientific and technological revolution has given to Britain in particular, and Europe in general, the technology to be able to locate underneath the earth, the earth, in the interior of the earth, the diamond veins. And the technology we wish to mine for it down in the depths of the earth, technology which never existed before. And so now the southern African region becomes a cluster of diamond and gold mines. One mine in particular becomes the most famous one of all. Three months ago, I stood myself at that mine. It was the biggest man-made hole in the world in a town called Kimberley. You've heard about Kimberley diamonds. Yeah. When the diamonds were discovered at Kimberley, and in the surrounding areas. It was the biggest discovery of diamonds in history. And I would suggest to you who are young and who have a thirst for knowledge, go study this part of history because tonight we have limited time. What the Jews did using an Englishman who was not a Jew, Cecil John, Rhodes, mm -hmm. using him as a front man, they always use a front man, but they stood behind him and they were able to manipulate the situation and gain control of the diamonds. The De Beers, De Beers Consolidated Diamond Company emerged and taking control of the diamonds. And the Rothschild family in Europe finances now the mining operations. And the bulk of the wealth which now emerges out of South Africa land up in the hands of the Jews. In 1914, the Kimberley mine was closed down because it had yielded all that it could yield. The rest that now remained was just chicken feed. Uh -huh. So they closed it down in 1914. When I went to that diamond mine in Kimberley, there were wheelbarrows filled with plastic cubes to show you, give you an estimate 
of how many diamonds were, came out of this diamond mine. There were five huge barrels filled, brim, heaping with these plastic cubes. That's how many diamonds they got. And these were sold in the market, the international market, at the premium price because they cornered the market through the consolidated De Beers to establish a monopoly to ensure that the price would not come down. The Prophet Islam, cursed that. When Kimberley was closed down in 1914, the European Jew now had amassed the maximum wealth he could amass at that period of time. This is just about 17 years after the Zionist movement was established. Within these 17 years, Dajjal had struck and had delivered to the European Jew this massive windfall of wealth. And so now they are ready in 1914 to move to the next stage. The philosophical and political systems were already in place. And now the military attack. <coughs> to destroy the Khilafah, you'll have to destroy the Ottoman Empire. And you cannot destroy the Ottoman Empire with 5,000 Jews in an army. You need a world war. <laughs> to destroy the Ottoman Empire. That's a tall order. So what you do is you plan a conspiracy and you stay behind so that your fingerprints are not on the crime. In other words, you plan a September the 11th. <laughs> huh? The attack play took place in the summer of 1914 when the Grand Duke Franz Ferdinand was assassinated in Sarajevo. In the summer of 1914, there were six major powers in Europe. And there was one dark horse across the Atlantic. No one knew how fast it could run, because it had never run in a race so far. One dark horse across the Atlantic. And six major powers in Europe. They were number one, Russia, France, Britain, Germany, Austria, Hungary, that's five. What's number six? Turkey. Ottoman Islamic Empire, ain't no Turkey as yet. Ottoman Islamic Empire. These are the six major powers. How can you bring about a world war which would result in the dismantling of the Ottoman Islamic Empire? You've got, a good, you've got to do some good planning to do this one. When they attacked and assassinated the Grand Duke Franz Ferdinand, they left footprints which led to Russia. As on September 11th, they, led, they left footprints which led to Al-Qaeda and, 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 and Saudi Arabia. Huh? The reason why, I forgot to mention this last night, the reason why they put so many Saudis on board the aeroplanes, you remember I told you about the Saudi who went to his government, he says, listen, I've heard in the newspapers and uh, on CNN that I'm dead. <laughs> I, I seems to me as though I'm alive. <laughs> what they had done was to hijack his identity and put it on board the plane. I forgot to mention to you last night why they had put so many Saudis. The reason for this is to attack the client relationship the friendly relations between the United States and the government of Saudi Arabia. If you can replace this with a new relationship of mistrust and hatred and enmity, it'll now, it'll now facilitate the Jews when they launch the big war to take control of the Saudi oil, which is about to happen. Hmm? This is why they put so many Saudis on board the aeroplanes. Good. They left footprints which led to Russia. And so Austria-Hungary had no option but to declare war on Russia. But Britain and France already had a treaty, a defense treaty with Russia. The Secretary of State, or the Foreign Minister in Britain, was a Jew. <laughs> and so Britain and France now had to declare war 
in favor of Russia against Austria-Hungary. But Germany has the same racial ties with Austria-Hungary, so Germany is now forced to enter the war on the side of Austria-Hungary. So they have succeeded. Whoever planned that assassination has succeeded in bringing all these powers now in Europe into a state of war. All that is left now is what they call the sick man of Europe. Who is that? Ottoman, Ottoman Islamic Empire. The Khalifa in Istanbul does not want to enter the war. He knows how weak the Ottoman army is in terms of military technology. But through internal intrigue within Istanbul, the Ottoman Empire is forced into the war and a Russian ship in the Bosphorus is used as a pretext. Once the war started, that massive wealth which the Jews had accumulated is now going to be used strategically for the purpose of influencing the direction of the war to get the prize that the Jews want. What is that prize? To destroy the Ottoman Islamic Empire, dismantle it, and to cut off the head of Islam, namely destroy the Khilafah. That's the prize they're after. The next prize is to liberate the Holy Land and to get the Holy Land for themselves. This is the prize they're after. Between 1914 and 1916, German submarines now make a surprise appearance into warfare. As when Israel launches her big war, we're going to see weapons that the world has never seen before being introduced into warfare. Hmm. When the German submarine entered into the war, it tipped the scales on the side of Germany. And by 1916, Britain was on the verge of defeat. German submarines had surrounded and marooned the island of Britain. The French government had fallen, and Germany had occupied France, and Britain was on her knees. This is the moment that the Jews were waiting for. Now the Czech is going to talk. It's called financial diplomacy. <laughs> the Jews, this is the German Jews, went to the British government and said, let's make a deal. Let's make a deal. We will intervene in the war with massive financial assistance to you. Massive. And we will bring that dark horse into the race. But that dark horse didn't want to come into the race. American public opinion was overwhelmingly against involvement in the war. And the most famous American of all was not the president. He was a man who had established the assembly line for producing motor cars. And what was supposed to have been a luxury item for only the rich, or you could, you could see how the rich people were grinding their teeth in anger, when the, this man caused the motor car to become accessible to ordinary Americans. For $700, you can get a motor car. $1,000, you can get a Model T. What is his name? Henry. Henry Ford. And this man did something else to his workers. He didn't bother about what was the market wage. No. He said, I am concerned with paying a just wage. And that market wage is not a just wage. And so he paid his workers a higher wage than the market wage. Mm -hmm. And so he won the hearts of the American people. He became an American icon. His name was Henry Ford. And he was totally opposed to American involvement in the war. But when the Jews went to the British government and said, let's make a deal, the British government said, deal. And so Jewish money, the diamonds of Kimberley began to roll. And Jewish money now enters into the war in a massive way. And Jewish influence over the media in the United States is now made to work. And American public opinion 
is being brainwashed and slowly, slowly transformed until suddenly, to the consternation of Henry Ford and so many Americans, Franklin Roosevelt declares war and the United States enters into the war. Britain, with this newfound wealth and with the assistance of the United States, now has a new lease of life and the war now takes on a direction that the Jews wanted from the first place. It is in 1916 that Jassasa went to work with British spies, British spies in Arabia. Lawrence of Arabia, of course, is the most well-known of them. These British spies were sent into Arabia, posing as Muslims. And they went to two actors in Arabia, two. One was Sharif Hussein, Sharif al Hussein, who was appointed by the Khalifa in Istanbul as the Sharif of the Hejaz, Mecca and Medina, in control. Mecca was under the control of an Arab battalion, but Medina was under the control of a Turkish battalion. And I wish I could understand why the Khalifa insisted on the Turkish battalion under the under the leadership of Fakhri Pasha to defend Medina. I don't know why. So when the British spies went to Hussein, they offered him the moon. <laughs> they offered him the moon. We will liberate the land of the hated Ottoman Turks and we will give you independence and freedom and you will now become the king of the Arabs. Remember, Britain is not talking about Khalifa, Khilafa, eh? No, no, we'll make you the king of the Arabs. And we also prepared to offer you a little, you know what, just seven million pounds. Huh? Seven million pounds at that time is what Bill Gates has now. Sharif Hussein, the great-great-grandfather of Abdullah, in Jordan now, then betrayed the Prophet Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam. Betrayed 1400 years of history of this ummah. Violated the plain and clear command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran in Suratul Ma'ida, in which he commanded us, Ya ayyuhal amanu la tat do not take the Jews and do not take the Christians as your awliya. Do not establish an alliance with them in which you become dependent upon them and subservient to them. Do not do that, says Allah. Ba'aduhum awliya wa they are protecting friends of each other. Whosoever from amongst you turn to them for that kind of an alliance. You no longer belong to this ummah. You now join them. Inna Allah la yahdil al Surely Allah will never provide guidance for a people who commit such an atrocious act of wrongdoing. And this is precisely what Sharif Hussein did and what all his descendants from that day to this day have been doing. But the chickens are coming to home to roost now for Abdullah. And the chickens are coming home to roost for Abdullah. When Mr. Bush attacks Iraq, then you're going to see Abdullah's suitcase is at work. <laughs> yeah. It, they all packed already, you know. <laughs> they all packed already. As soon as Mr. Bush attacks Iraq, you'll see where Abdullah is going to be heading for. Sharif Hussein now accepts 7, 000, 7 million sterling pounds and enters into a military alliance with Britain and declares himself independent of the Ottoman Khalifa. Once the Khilafa in Istanbul had lost control of Mecca and Medina, had lost control of the Haramain, had lost control of the Hajj, you pull the carpet, you pull the rug from underneath the feet of the Khalifa. 
His Khilafah is now losing legitimacy. Can anyone be Khalifa? Can you appoint a Khalifa here in downtown Lakemba? Can Mullah Umar have been recognized as the Khalifa? No, why not? Because when the Hajj comes, Amirul Mu'mineen Mullah Umar will have to apply for a Saudi visa to perform the Hajj. <laughs> huh? And if the Saudis reject the visa, the Khalifa can't perform the, visa, the, the Hajj. All right? And so the British calculated, if we can wrest control of the Haramain and the Hajj away from the Khalifa in Istanbul, then the legitimacy of his Khilafah will begin to crumble. And so this was 1916. The British spies then went to the second actor in the Arabian Peninsula. I mean, Britain has a PhD in deception. If you want to destroy the Khilafah, okay, you have to make sure that it cannot be restored. How can you take the entire world of Islam with so many ulama and ensure that not only is the Khilafah destroyed, but it cannot be restored? That's a tall order. How to do it? The answer is, you not only have to liberate the Haramein from the control of the Khalifa in Istanbul, but you have to put it in the control of those who will not themselves claim the Khilafa and will not allow anyone else to claim the Khilafa. And so long as these people keep control of the Haramein and the Hajj, the Khilafah can never be restored. Simple, isn't it? Simple, isn't it? And so that is why they had to make the trip to Riyadh to meet... What's his name? Abdul Aziz? Ibn Saud? Correct name? Of course it's the correct name. Why are you afraid to mention it? <laughs> but Abul Aziz ibn Saud did not control the Hijaz. So he couldn't command the check for seven million pounds. Huh? He had to be content with something less than that. So what the British offered to him was if you would sign the same kind of agreement with us, and violate the specific command in the Quran and betray Allah and his messenger and betray the Ummah, if you will do that, we pay you 5,000 pounds a month. Would you accept that? Abdul Aziz says, yes. Yes. <laughs> and in 1916, Abdul Aziz ibn Saud signed an agreement with Britain. Yes which made of him a military ally of Britain, subservient to Britain. But when the Ikhwan, who were his military force, questioned him, how can you sign this agreement with Britain? And how can you accept this money from Britain, 5,000 pounds a month? Abdul Aziz ibn Isaw says, this is jizya. <laughs> Jizya is what they pay to me because I control them. <laughs> it was dust in their eyes and they swallowed it. And so Abdul Aziz ibn Saud got away with it. Massive betrayal and a very dangerous plan is now in place. As soon as the Khilafah is destroyed, that Abdul Aziz ibn Saud will be given what is known as the green light, something that Saddam Hussein knows about, the green light. And then he will attack and take control of the Haramain. 
And when once he does that, he won't make the mistake of ever claiming the Khilafah for himself. And he will never allow anyone else <laughs> to claim the Khilafah. Because no one else can take the control of the Hijaz and the Haramain from them, because they are supported by Britain. And so goodbye to the Khilafah. It's gone. It can never be restored. Never, never, never be restored. So long as Britain and the United States of America underwrite the security of the Saudi state, you can never, never, never restore the Khilafah. By 1919, the Ottoman Empire was in shambles, falling apart. And a British army under General Allenby, with many Arabs and Punjabi Muslims fighting faithfully under his control, attacked the Turkish garrison which was defending Jerusalem, defeated it, and liberated the Holy Land. This was a joyous day for the Jews because now the countdown is really moving forward and the golden age is coming back. In the same 1919, when the Ottoman Empire is collapsing, and it is losing all its non-Turkish possessions, all the Arab parts of the Ottoman Empire are falling away. The Greek army now invades the Turkish mainland, Anatolia. And the Turkish people now have a tremendous fright in their hearts because the Greeks hate them with a PhD in hatred. So Britain now has to create a Turkish general who would appear to the Turkish people as a savior who has come down from the heavens with his hands resting on the wings of angels to save the Turkish people. And so at a place called Gallipoli, a man named Mustafa Kemal inflicts a defeat on the ruling state in the world. Britain, and immediately climbs the ladder to become the hero of all heroes in Turkish history. Very convenient, isn't it? Mustafa Kemal now takes over. He is in fact de facto, de facto ruler over the Ottoman Empire. And the Khalifa is just a piece of furniture. In 1920, I think, or 21, there was a big treaty, uh, negotiations in Versailles. And from this emerged now the Turkish Republic, which replaces the Ottoman Islamic State. But Mustafa Kemal said, the Turkish people love their Khalifa. So if Europe could have a Pope, well, why can't we have a Pope too? This was simplistic thinking on the part of Mustafa Kemal. If the Europeans could have a Pope, well, so too can we. So the new Turkish government of Mustafa Kemal decided to take the Khilafa and remove from it all political authority and make the Khalifa the equivalent of the Pope. This was 1922. And things were going fine for him. Turkish people were happy. Khilafah is still there. And the leadership of the revolution in Turkey were very happy because we have a secular state now, a model after the European state. But in 1924, on the 3rd of March, suddenly Britain demanded, of course, this is secret. They wouldn't reveal it. Britain demanded of, Ottoman, of, of Mustafa Kemal that he must abolish the Khilafah. The demand came from Britain. And on the 3rd of March 1924, the Turkish Republic abolished the Khilafah. The question we have to ask is, why did they do it when there was no need to do it? Nothing.
It, it represented no threat whatsoever to the secular Turkish Republic. The answer for the abolition of the Khilafah on the 3rd of March 1924 is located in a place called India. But even the Indian scholars of Islam are not aware of it. <laughs> even they are not aware of it. When the attack on the Khilafah was taking place in the 1916, 17, 18 period, then Indian ulama, at that time the Indian Muslim community was one of the most influential Muslim communities in the world. And the Indian Muslim community was led by leaders who knew Islam and lived Islam. Hmm? Men like Maulana Muhammad Ali Jauhar, Maulana Shaukat Ali, Maulana Sayyid Suleiman Nadwi, Mufti Kifayatullah, men who knew Islam and lived Islam. And they wanted to get rid of British imperial rule in, Britain, in, in India. So that when they got rid of the British, they could restore Islamic rule over Muslims. That's all they wanted. Get rid of the British and restore Islamic rule over Muslims. And they realized that they could mobilize the Muslim masses of India over this issue of the Khilafah because everybody loved the Khilafah. And so they established a movement which they call the Khilafat Movement, Haratul Khilafah, Harakatul Khilafah, the Khilafat Movement. When they established the Khilafat Movement and it began to mobilize the Muslim masses, the body which was sleeping is now waking up for revolutionary struggle to preserve the Khilafah in Istanbul. The leader of the Hindus realized, but wait a minute, the Muslims want the same thing that we want. We also want the Hindus, we want to get rid of the British, and we want to restore Hindu rule over the Hindus. So there's a conversion of interest here. So Gandhi, who later became known as Mahatma Gandhi, Gandhi approached the leadership of the Khilafat movement, and he said to them, listen, the same thing you want, the same thing I want. So why don't we join forces? Will you allow me to join the Khilafat movement? And guess what the leadership of the Indian Muslims did? It was revolutionary theory on their part. And we praise them tonight. They admitted they accepted the offer of Gandhi and they formed an alliance. And so the Khilafat movement in India now became a Hindu-Muslim alliance for the purpose of getting rid of British rule. And then that would replace, that with which would replace British rule would be Islamic rule over Muslims, and Hindu rule over Hindus. This constituted the most dangerous of all threats that Western civilization have ex ever experienced in its entire period of colonization of mankind, this Khilafat movement. Because the Western objective was to demolish every existing state structure in the world and replace it with the secular state. So that the, eventually the secular state could be brought under the umbrella of a League of Nations and eventually a United Nations, and this would be political globalization at work. Hmm? If the Khilafat movement were to succeed, then one of the most important communities in the world, the Indian Muslims, will escape. Because when the British withdrew, Muslims will be ruled by Islam and Hindus will be ruled by Hinduism. Between 1920 and 1924, the Khilafat movement was building up steam at an alarming rate. 
And by 1924, the British had calculated, we have to get rid of this Khilafat movement. And the only way we can think of now is to abolish the Khilafat. And so they put the pressure on Mustafa Kemal. As soon as the Khilafat was abolished, the Khilafat movement in India began to lose steam. In the same year that it was abolished in 1924, in that same year, the secularly minded British, uh, in, Indi in Indian language they call it chamcha, <laughs> the stooges of the British in India, the brown-skinned Englishmen parading as Muslims, hmm? of whom the prince of them all was the grandfather of the present Aga Khan, Karim Aga Khan's grandfather. They now restore an organization called the All India Muslim League. Huh? The All India Muslim League is led by men who don't know Islam and don't live Islam. And these are the people who now wage a struggle for the liberation of the Muslims from British rule to be replaced, not with rule of Islam, oh no, but rather by the rule of the secular Republic of Pakistan and the secular Republic of India. So that Pakistan and India could be embraced within the community of secular nation states. But of course you had to put a little red herring to fool to fool the people. So you have to make it appear as though Pakistan is going to emerge as an Islamic state, but that's just dust in their eyes. To fool those who see with only one eye. And so in 1924, on the 3rd of March, the Caliphate was abolished. When the Caliphate was abolished, Sharif al Hussein realized that he was in grave danger now. So long as there was a Khalifa in Istanbul, the British needed him. <laughs> but now that the Caliphate was destroyed, abolished, Sharif al Hussein now realizes the plan. He says, Oh my gosh, they're going to send Abdulaziz ibn Saud to cut my throat now. In exactly the same way that Abdullah of Jordan is now realizing, as soon as Bush attacks Iraq, that is the end of me. Hmm? So uh, Sharif al Hussein decides four days later, on the 7th of March 1924, to claim the Khilafah for himself. But when you're a client state of Britain, you can't do that. You have to first apply to the British government for permission <laughs> to become the Khalifa. Hmm? He didn't do that. As soon as Sharif al Hussein claimed the Khilafat for himself on the 7th of March 1924, you're going to get all of this information in that book which is outside the Caliphate, the Hijaz, and the Saudi Wahhabi nation state. As soon as he did that, Britain gave the green light to Abdul Aziz. Attack. Within six months, the Saudi uh, the, uh, 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 army of Abdul Aziz ibn Saud conquered Makkah. And Abdul Aziz and Sharif Hussein packed his suitcase and off he went. British took him away. This one the Americans will take out of Jordan. And so Abdul Aziz ibn Saud is now in control of Mecca and eventually Medina. It's a Saudi Wahhabi alliance. Does he claim the Khilafah for himself now? No. What he does is, as soon as he enters Mecca, in 1924, October, Abdul Aziz ibn Saud makes a proclamation and they're going to hate me for revealing this to you. Because nobody remembers it now. The proclamation which he makes is that this land belongs to the entire Ummah. Huh? This land belongs to the entire Ummah. I wonder how a Pakistani or a Bengali Muslim will feel when he hears that and he's been rounded up like dogs, stray dogs and put on trucks because he's overstayed his visa while white-skinned Americans and British are treated like princes 
and the Holy Land. How will a Pakistani or Indian or Bangladeshi feel? This land belongs to the entire Ummah. And it is for the Ummah, not for Abdul Aziz ibn Saud, for the Ummah to establish the government which will rule over this land. That is his proclamation in 1924. But in cricket it's called playing for time. He did this because in April of 1924, Al-Azhar University had responded to the Turkish abolition of the Khilafah. What did they do? Al-Azhar University declared that this was bid'ah and haram to abolish the Khilafah. Hmm? And therefore we must respond to it. And the response of Al-Azhar is that we must have a mu'tamar, a conference which would meet and which would appoint a new Khalifa. As soon as Al-Azhar issued this proclamation, you could see how Britain was trembling. The British government can't digest their food now. They've got to plan some counter strategy to the initiative of Al-Azhar University. The counter strategy is that Egypt is itself not a free country. It may appear free, but Britain really has control over Egypt. So Britain puts pressure on King Fuad, the father of King Farouk. You're too old to hear about, you're too young to know about this. And King Fahud, uh, Fuad is now putting pressure on Al-Azhar to hold back on this conference. Hmm? So for two years, the conference can't take place. Two years because of British pressure. The conference finally takes place in June, July of 1926. But Britain uses another counter strategy. She gets Abdul Aziz ibn Saud in Mecca to also convene a conference of the world of Islam in Mecca at the time of the Hajj, which is May of 1926. And then Britain and Russia and France and China and all the major powers in Europe all get to work. Massive intervention in the affairs of the world of Islam to ensure that the Cairo conference does not succeed in winning a representative gathering and that the Mecca conference gets all the Muslims attending it. And they succeeded. The Cairo conference, organized by Al-Azhar University, becomes an essentially Arab conference, because non-Arabs are hardly present. The conference met. The conference decided that the Khilafah was an essential part of the deen, that it was bid'ah and haram to abolish it, that the Khilafah must be restored, but we don't know how to do it. So let's go back home and come back after one year. That was the decision. We don't know how to do it. But in Mecca, you had the most successful representation of the entire world of Islam, because Britain really went to work on it. This conference is now convened, but strangely, for the Wahhabi movement strangely for the Wahhabi movement, which is a religious movement, which declares that it is bringing back the original Islam and removing all the extraneous things which had been added and cutting out all the shirk. So this is the real Islam. Well, then how come you don't even have the subject of the Khilafah in your agenda for your conference? We asked the Wahhabi movement, give us an answer. There is no answer. The answer is that the Wahhabi Saudi alliance is now perpetrating a gigantic, a massive betrayal of Islam in abandoning the Khilafah. And so the conference takes place. But the subject of the Khilafah is not even on the agenda of the conference. Instead, Abdul Aziz ibn Saud approaches the conference twice. 
himself in person. And he asks the conference to recognize him as Al Malik. <laughs> that his rule should be recognized over the Hijaz. When the conference had heard His Majesty the King on both occasions, and the conference is now sitting down to discuss the matter, shall we recognize Saudi Wahhabi rule over the Hijaz? The leader of the Indian Muslim delegation jumped up to speak first. He spoke first. His name was Maulana Muhammad Ali Jauhar. He got up and he told the king, get lost. We'll never do that. As soon as the leadership of the Indian Muslim delegation had established his position of rejecting the claim of the Saudi Wahhabi leadership for sovereignty and control over the Hijaz, the rest of the delegates couldn't say, mm. that was the power of a man who knew Islam and lived Islam. And so the conference ended without giving to the Saudi Wahhabi rule over the Hijaz recognition. They decided that they'll meet every year, but that was the last time they ever met. This then was the response of the world of Islam to the abolition of the Khilafah. In 1930, I think, or 31, Hajj Amin al Hussein in Jerusalem felt that the ominous advance of the Jews in the Holy Land required a response from the world of Islam. So he sought to reconvene the conference in Jerusalem. But it, it was a new conference. It gave it a new name in 1930 or 31. They call it the Al Aqsa conference or the Mu'tamar al Am. And this conference also met in 1930-31, but you meeting to establish Darul Islam in a territory which is under British rule. Nothing could be more foolish than that. How can you restore Darul Islam when you're meeting in a territory which is under British rule? And you, get a, you have to get permission from the British government to hold your conference. So the conference ended without being able to do anything about it. Since then to this day, there has been no effort, no significant effort on the part of the world of Islam to restore the Khilafah. Why? Simple. Because you cannot restore the Khilafah unless, unless and until you can liberate the Hijaz, Makkah and Medina. You can't do that. When the Hijaz, the security of the Hijaz is underwritten by Uncle Sam. What is the replacement of the Khilafah? Around the world, beginning with the secular republic of Turkey, and then an Iran which resembles a Shia republic, but essentially is a secular republic. And then the secular republic of Pakistan, which of course has now become the American Republic of Pakistan. And then in 1933, the Republic of Saudi Arabia, but they're parading as a monarchy, but it's actually a secular state because it has all the trappings of a secular state. A secular state has territorial sovereignty. The state of Saudi, Saudi Arabia has territorial sovereignty. A secular state has citizenship. Once upon a time when I went to Mecca, I was Muslim. And the only difference between me and my fellow Muslim was resident in Mecca was that I was Musafir and he was second. Hmm? Other than that, we're the same. But now, I am a foreigner. If this is not Bid'ah, I should change my name. I am now a foreign national. And they are Saudis. And all the oil that Dajjal discovered underneath the soil belongs to them. They own it. So what about Abdulaziz Ibn Saud's proclamation that this entire land belongs to the world of Islam? 
That's forgotten. That's why they hate me for reminding you of these things. The entire world is now embraced. The entire world of Islam is now embraced by the modern secular state. Now, let me say to you before I leave Australia, any Muslim, whenever I talk on two subjects, a lot of people now begin to behave strangely towards me. But while it pains my heart, it will not change me. Because I do not teach Islam to please people. I try to do it to please my Lord. When I talk on the subject of riba, some people begin to hate me. Yeah, it doesn't matter. And when I talk on this subject also, when a Muslim pledges his allegiance to the modern secular state and to its constitution, which declares that Allah is no longer al-Malik, no longer al-Akbar, no longer al-Hakam. The state is now al-Malik, al-Akbar, and al-Hakam. And the state can make halal what Allah made haram. When a Muslim pledges his allegiance, you've got to do that to get citizenship. Oh yeah, can't get a US passport without pledging allegiance. When you do that, you commit shirk. If you don't believe me, no problem, no problem. When you reach the grave, then you see. When a Muslim goes and votes in the elections to constitute the government which will preside over this shirk, you enter into shirk. But if you don't believe me and you want to go and vote in the elections, I am not stopping you. So don't let there be any bad blood between us. I'm not stopping you. But when you enter in the grave and you find that you've entered into shirk, do not plead ignorance, that's all. Stand up like a man and take it on that day. This is now the universal shirk that the Prophet ﷺ had prophesied. He said the time would come when shirk will be everywhere, it be so difficult to recognize it. However, as difficult as it would be to recognize a black ant on a black stone on a dark night. So if you did not recognize it before this lecture, don't be surprised, but now you know. This universal secular state is now used to embrace all of mankind, including the world of Islam, in political globalization. So that eventually you have one government over all of mankind, eventually the Jews will now rule the world using that structure. That's about to happen. We already, we already made significant progress towards that day. When you read this book, Jerusalem in the Quran, which I believe is the first and only book on the subject, because you couldn't write this book before 1948. Nobody could write it before 1948. Not in 1400 years of this history. In fact, it was difficult to write this book in 1940. It's easy to write it now, but difficult to write it at that time. When you read this book, then you'll understand why it is, I say, that we are now located at that moment in time when one, le one ruling state is about to give way to another, that the state of Israel is about to replace the United States as the ruling state in the world. When Israel takes over from the United States with that big war which is about to take place, and the American economy collapses and the US dollar collapses and all the paper money in the world collapses and this is going to be my lecture next Wednesday, inshallah, on Islam and the international monetary system, please come to it. Then we see that transfer of power. Israel takes control of the oil, for example, of the Middle East. When Israel becomes the ruling state in the world, then the Jews will say, the golden age has come again. The prophecy is being fulfilled. But they're being deceived in the grandest and most magnificent deception mankind has ever witnessed. No, this is not the golden age. You've been deceived by al Masihud Dajjal. Hmm? Israel will rule the world for a day which is like a week. 
if you disagree with me, you say, we never heard this before. Our sheikhs who taught us Islam, they never talked about this, so you must be wrong. My response is, wait and see. That's all. I don't have to say anything more than that. How long will a day which is like a week last? How long? How long will Israel rule the world? And what will be our predicament during that time? This is what I spoke about last night. You cannot establish Islam at the macro level, so go ahead and establish at the micro level. The jihad is already in force to liberate the Holy Land. No one can stop that jihad. No one can stop it. The jihad is already in force to liberate the territory from where the army will come from Khorasan. No one can stop that jihad. When you see that army coming from Khorasan, the Prophet said, go and join that army, even if you have to crawl over ice. Because no one will be able to stop that army until it reaches Jerusalem. When a day which is like a week has come to an end, and we will know that because the water in the Sea of Galilee would have dried up. That is the time when these events are now going to take place. The advent of Imam al-Mahdi, Dajjal appearing in a day which is like our day, so we'll see him as a Jew, etc. And the son of Mary coming down. There are some of you who have become a bit uncomfortable with my statement that I said it, it would be perhaps within the next 50 years. And I went on to say I can be wrong. If this statement is uncomfortable to you, I can make another statement which means exactly the same thing. Exactly the same thing. I can say that I expect the Sea of Galilee to dry up in about 50 years. I hope you'd have no objections to that. Huh? But it's the same thing. Because it is when the water in the Sea of Galilee dries up that the son of Mary will come back down. Go and read your Sahih Muslim. Hmm? It is at that time, and go and notice the water level in the Sea of Galilee now. It is lower than it has ever been before in history, and, and Lebanon is about to take water out of the river. What's the name of the river? Litany? Huh? Whatever is the name of the river. <laughs> Lebanon is about to take water out of that river, and Israel is saying, if you do that, we're going to wage war against you. Why? Because that water runs into the Sea of Galilee. Yes. And so the hadith of the Prophet Muhammad is now moving to center stage. If I say 50 years and if I say I can be wrong, at least I'm giving you a wake-up call. A wake-up call that you're living in the age of the countdown. So don't be fighting each other over chicken feed. That's what you're doing. In South Africa in particular, the ulama fighting with each other, sectarian conflicts over chicken feed. While this hugely important subject is so far away from them, it is unbelievable. When the water in the Sea of Galilee is drying up, and the state of Israel has ruled the world for a day which is like a week, then in Sahih Muslim we are told, a Muslim ruler will die and there will be disagreement concerning succession. And then a man is going to come out of Mecca. His name will be my name and his father's name will be my father's name, said the Prophet ﷺ. He'll have a broad forehead and a large nose. And he'll be known as Al-Mahdi. And he'd hurry from, from Medina to Mecca. As he approaches Mecca, people are going to come out to him, so this has to be a well-known person. Not some obscure non-entity, a well-known person. When the people of Mecca come out to him, they'll force him to accept the bay'ah. The oath of allegiance which legitimizes the leadership of the Amir al-Mu'mineen, bay'ah. 
he will accept the bay'ah at the Kaaba and then proclaim himself to be Al Mahdi. It is only then that you would know that Al Mahdi is here. So stop asking these foolish questions. Is he born already? Is he in Lebanon? Or maybe in Indonesia? That's foolishness. Al Mahdi cannot emerge until Israel has become the ruling state in the world. Al Mahdi cannot emerge until Dajjal has completed his mission. Al Mahdi cannot emerge until the state of Israel has ruled the world for a day which is like a week. Al Mahdi cannot emerge until the water has dried in the Sea of Galilee. So stop these foolish questions. He proclaims himself to be the Mahdi. There are going to be eclipses of the sun and the moon that month. But there have been eclipses of the sun and the moon in the past. But after he proclaims himself Al Mahdi, he's going to be attacked from an army, with an army from Sham. That army comes down to the south and armies are under the control of governments. And when that army is between Medina and Makkah going down south, the earth is going to open and swallow that army. That is the sign of all signs. Beyond the shadow of a doubt, validating the claim of this man that he is the Mahdi. Hmm? But Makkah has never been a Shia city. Never. And Mecca will not be a Shia city at that time. And Mecca will not come out to give allegiance to a Shia. And so you have to be living on the moon to believe that the Mahdi is going to be Shia. We do not say this to embarrass the Shia or to be uncharitable to them or to hurt their feelings in any way. This is just factual analysis. When the earth opens and swallows that army, then on that day, those from the world of the Shia who accept him as the Mahdi and follow him are our brothers in faith. And shoulder to shoulder we'll fight to liberate the Holy Land. But those from the Shia, and we anticipate that there will be those who will now reject him as the Mahdi because he is not Shia. You are not our brothers in faith. And you will not fight with us shoulder to shoulder to liberate the Holy Land. When the army is swallowed, then the Mahdi is going to be attacked by another army. And this is now an army of the Quraysh, an army of the Kalb. And remember that armies are under the control of governments. The Mahdi will defeat this army. And when our army is defeated, that is the end of Saudi Arabia. Goodbye to bad rubbish. Goodbye to bad rubbish. Let it be recorded in my book tonight. Let it be recorded in your book tonight. Goodbye to bad rubbish. The most monstrous betrayal of Islam ever committed in history, committed by those who control that state. Now Darul Islam is restored. Yeah, this is Islam, not that. And let it be clear that there are so many Salafi Muslims in Saudi Arabia in prison because they too are struggling for the same thing that I am struggling to liberate that land. Let it be clear that there's a man like Sheikh Safar al Hawali who is at the forefront intellectually, spiritually and theoretically at the forefront. I benefited from his thought. And so do not remain with this sectarian conflict and describe that masjid, Salafi masjid, this one Sunni masjid, this one Indonesian masjid, that one Malay masjid. I thought the masjid was the house of Allah. Has it changed? (laughs) 
when Darul Islam is restored in the Arabian Peninsula, this is now the most dangerous and potent of all threats to the state of Israel. Dajjal will now attack. He's now in a day which is like our day. And so we see him, a Jew, a young man, powerful, built curly here. But I'm not saying anything about his eyes because you understand the hadith about the eyes now. The Prophet ﷺ pointed his hands to the east 20 times. And he said he's going to come from the east. Jerusalem is northwest. <laughs> When Israel attacked Jamal Abdel Nasser, although Israel is to the east of Egypt, Israel attacked from the west and destroyed the Egyptian air force on the ground in the Six-Day War. Similarly, Dajjal is not going to attack from the northwest. He attacks from the east 20 times, said Muhammad Wasallam. You can come from the east. When he attacks, he's going to be riding on a donkey which will travel as fast as the clouds and which is have his ears stretched out wide. I'm going to Perth, inshallah, on Thursday on that donkey. <laughs> and so we're talking about fighter aircraft and east of Medina and Mecca is the Saudi Air Force Base which is now also an American Air Force Base in Dahran. As they attack Mecca and Medina the angels defend Mecca and Medina. This is there in Sahih Muslim and the attack is diverted to Damascus. And then the confrontation takes place. Dajjal is outside and the Imam is inside, the masjid. And now history repeats itself. The Jews are rubbing their hands. We got them now. There's no escape. We got them. We have them in our sights now. As someone else was rubbing his hands, as his army was approaching them, and in front of them was the sea, and behind them is the army, and they're rubbing their hands. We got them now. Who was he? Fir'aun. And so history repeats itself. But at the last moment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to Musa alayhi salam, take your rod and strike the water. And then the divine intervention took place, the miracle. And the believers were saved. وَإِذْ فَرَقْنَا بِكُمُ الْبَحْرِ فَأَنْجَيْنَاكُمْ وَأَغْرَقْنَا آلَ فِرْعَوْنَ وَأَنْتُمْ تَنْزُرُونَ Now history repeats itself. As the Jews are rubbing their hands, we've got them now, we've cornered them. At that last moment, history repeats itself. The son of Mary comes down with his hand resting on the wings of two angels. The first time he came, Allah raised the man. And when the Messiah came, he came in front of that man. And that man said, here he is, this is the man you've been waiting for, this is the Messiah. Who was that man? <laughs> Yahya alayhi salam. So this is the divine method for positive identification. But Ibn Khaldun, may Allah bless him and have mercy on his soul. That great scholar, we are not fit to clean his shoes. Ibn Khaldun did not understand this. And Muhammad Iqbal, that great scholar, we are not fit to clean his shoes. But Muhammad Iqbal did not understand this. And so many other scholars have not understood it. And they rejected all the ahadith on Mahdi as fabricated. Ibn Khaldun did it and everybody else followed him. But now history repeats itself. The divine method of positive identification is repeated. As the son of Mary comes down in the masjid, 
Imam al-Mahdi says, here he is, this is the son of Mary. And history repeats itself. May Allah forgive Ibn Khaldun. And then the son of Mary responds and identifies himself. Imam asks him, you lead the Salat. He says, no, you are the Imam, you lead. After the Salat, then the confrontation takes place between the false Messiah and the true Messiah. And the false Messiah is killed. And then Gog and Magog are destroyed. The Sea of Galilee is dry. And after Gog and Magog are destroyed and Dajjal is killed, now the state of Israel is without any support. Now it's going to be a level battlefield. A level battlefield. I may be wrong, but I suspect that there's going to be a massive collapse of the world of modern technology. I suspect that. And so horses are now going to be used once again. Yeah. The army now comes out of Khorasan, and that army attacks and destroys the state of Israel. The first time it was a Babylonian army. The second time it was a Roman army. And after the Roman army destroyed them and threw them out of the land, Allah said, Oin Udtum, Udna. Oin Udtum, Udna. If you return with your facade, we will return with our punishment. They return with their facade. It's happening now before your eyes. And so Allah returns with his punishment. Wain Udtum, Udna. And so now the Muslim army destroys the state of Israel. It is at this time that the Prophet said, alayhi salatu wasalam, the hadith in Sahih Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, you will know who is the true leader amongst the Muslims today, because he'll not be afraid to quote this hadith. And you'll know those who betray Islam, because they will never quote this hadith. Never. They'll lose their jobs. La tuqatilunna al Ah, if you're 17 years of age tonight, this is music in your heart. Yeah, if the beard is gray, well, things are not the same anymore. You will most certainly fight the Jews. And you will most certainly kill them. And at that time the stones will speak. Muslim, there's a Jew hiding behind me. Come and kill him. Hmm? And so the Holy Land is liberated. This ends the subject of Imam al-Mahdi and the return of the Khilafah. What happens after that we'll pick up in our subject on Jerusalem in the Quran, which will be on Monday night. What I'd like you to do is if you have any questions, please write them very quickly. We have paper. Question one. Please define the geography of Khorasan. Where is Khorasan? Khorasan. Khorasan. In the time of the Prophet wasalam, has been researched by the eminent Pakistani scholar, Dr. Isra Rahman, and he has explained that Khorasan is that territory which extends from northwest Pakistan, the Pathan Belt, northeast Iran, the whole of Afghanistan and the territory north of Afghanistan. But clearly Afghanistan is in the heart of Khorasan. No. This territory has one thing distinctive about it. That Europe could never colonize the heart of Khorasan. The British tried when Britain was the ruling state in the world. And the British failed. 
And then the Russians tried when they had the superpower, the Soviet Union. And after 12 years, the Russians fail. And guess who is trying now? Yes. The war, the war in Khorasan has just begun, Mr. Bush. It has just begun. On that day, when Islam liberates Afghanistan, I believe it is that army which will be unstoppable until it reaches Jerusalem. Please give us an alternative to citizenship and it's shirk. I want to confess to you the limitations of my thought. And then we must all collectively think. I can't do all the thinking. There are amongst you here tonight those who are better thinkers than I am and who will be able to extend my thought. Do not enter into citizenship where you have to pledge allegiance to a secular state because that is direct involvement in shit. But when citizenship is conferred upon you without your having to pledge any allegiance, you are born in a particular territory, then you have not entered into shirk because you have not pledged any allegiance. And in that territory and elsewhere in the world, you make it plain and clear for everybody down here and everybody up there to hear. I do not recognize the sovereignty of that state. If even with that state where you have citizenship, you are now denied citizenship, then you become what we were when we left Mecca and went to Medina. What were we? Yes, refugees. And there are many people in the world today who have refugee status, probably some are here in this room tonight. In most of the Muslim countries nowadays, it is constitutionally mentioned that sovereignty is vested in the people of the country. So those who are living in the country, accepting the sovereignty, are they all in shirk? You can live in the country. You can be a citizen of the country without having ever pledged allegiance to the state and to its constitution. Yeah. Without ever having voted in election. But I was told yesterday that in Australia, if you do not go and vote in elections, you have to pay a fine. If I were here, I'd pay the fine. <laughs> I'd pay the fine, yes. No, wait, wait. We, we can't allow questions. Please write it down. No, no, no. When does see if you can check that out for me? Did you say that the Mahdi is a Shia? <laughs> no, I said that the Mahdi will leave Medina. No, I didn't say that. The Prophet said that alayhi salatu wasalam. The Mahdi would leave Medina and hurry towards Mecca and the hadith was that the people of Mecca would come out to him and force him to accept the bay'ah and he would accept the bay'ah at the Kaaba and proclaim himself to be the Mahdi. I then went on to say that Mecca has never been a Shia city, never in all history and Mecca is not going to become a Shia city and Mecca will not go out to a Shia to force him to accept the bayah. To believe in that, you should live on the moon. And therefore, the Mahdi cannot be Shia. When the Mahdi proclaims himself to be Mahdi, those amongst the Shia who accept him and follow him are our brothers in faith and will fight with us side by side, shoulder to shoulder, 
in li liberating the Holy Land. <clears throat> but when those amongst the Shia refuse to accepting as the Mahdi, they will no longer be recognized as our brothers in faith and will not fight with us shoulder to shoulder in order to liberate the Holy Land. When does one become a Muslim? One can be a Muslim in your heart, but we don't know it. So if you die, we can't bury you. No. We can't bury you. We can't give you Salatul Janazah. Although you're a Muslim in your heart. Okay? We cannot perform the Salatul Janazah over you. The only time we can perform the Salatul Janazah over you is when you publicly declare yourself in the presence of witnesses that you are Muslim. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. You said that the Khilafah will not return until the Kaaba is taken control of. But when the proper, the Prophet established his state in Medina, he was not in control of the Kaaba. Please explain. If anyone chooses to argue that the Khilafah can be restored, before the advent of Imam al-Mahdi, I have no quarrel with him. No. If he wants to launch a movement to restore the Khilafah now, I don't have any quarrel with him and you should not have any quarrel with him. We have come to this conclusion because we understand that yet Juj and Ma'juj were released in the lifetime of the Prophet ﷺ. And we therefore recognize the world order which today controls the world to be the world order of yet Juj and Ma'juj. You do not, but we do. If we recognize this world order to be the world order of yet Juj and Ma'juj, and so long as they control the world, you cannot restore the Khilafah. They will destroy it. <coughs> On that day when they no longer control the world, yes, at that time the Khilafah can be restored. But when will they no longer control the world? It will be at that time when Al-Masih dajjal has completed his mission. When he has completed his mission, then comes the unfolding of the events where the true Messiah will kill the false Messiah and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will destroy Ya'juj and Ma'juj. Then it will be possible to restore the Khilafah. But those who differ and say no, Ya'juj and Ma'juj will not be released until after the return of Nabi Isa al-Islam. We say to them, brother, keep waiting, keep waiting, keep waiting for that day. That's all we have to say to you. Nothing more. When the American economy collapses and Israel rules the world, for approximately how long will they rule? One can only guess. One can only guess. No one can give a specific answer. The specific answer, of course, is that Israel will rule the world for a day which will be like a week. But if you want me to spell out how long will a day like a week last, I can only guess. The answer is that a day which is like a week will last for as long as it takes for the Sea of Galilee to dry up. So now how long will it take for the Sea of Galilee to dry up? I can only make a guess. I can be wrong, but at least I'm guessing which is more than they are doing who are only eating halwa. <laughs> My guess was about 50 years, but I can be wrong. When the Sea of Galilee dries up, that is the time when Israel will no longer rule the world. I love this hadith. Guess why? 
because George Bush could watch the Sea of Galilee going down. And Tony was his name? Yes. And Ariel was his name? Sharon. Yeah. And the Jews? They can watch the Sea of Galilee going down and drying up. And they can realize that the moment is coming. Yeah, Muslim. That moment is approaching as the water is drying up. I love this hadith. Why is Iran's oil? This was uh, last night's lecture. I explained this last night. That when Israel wages a big war, which is coming up, hmm, which is why Bush has to attack Iran, hmm, so that Israel can now wage the war and not appear to be an aggressor, which is why Abdullah of Jordan has his suitcases packed already. When Israel wages a big war, in order for her to become the ruling state in the world, she'll have to seize the oil, Saudi oil, Iraqi oil, Kuwaiti oil, etc. But I said, I don't think they'll touch the Iranian oil. Why? He asks. The answer is, without in any way being disrespectful to the Shia, without in any way being uncharitable to the Shia, no, that's not my method. Anyone who declares of Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu, that he was a usurper, is misguided. And anyone who compounds that by declaring that Omar Farooq radiallahu ta'ala anhu was a usurper, is doubly misguided. And anyone who further compounds that by declaring of a third of the eminent companions of the Prophet Muhammad alayhi salatu waslam, that Uthman Ghani radiallahu ta'ala anhu was a usurper, is casting a massive vote of no confidence in Muhammad sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wasallam. The three of his foremost companions were usurpers robbing people of their legitimate position, like robbers and bandits. So anyone who declares of this, like this, are a people who are significantly misguided. That's all. This is not an uncharitable statement. This is a factual statement. A less than valid less than authentic expression of Islam will always be advantageous to Dajjal. Because if this less than authentic expression of Islam is the only Islam which can mount a successful Islamic revolution, the only one, then the Muslim masses around the world will eventually be told that is the valid Islam. Because that's the only one which has succeeded in the world. So you should give up the authentic Islam that you have and adopt that less than authentic Islam. Why would Israel want to dismantle such a state? No, it will not be in, in the interest of Israel to attack and seize the Iranian oil. But having said this, let it be clear that this is meant not, this statement of mine is not meant to show any disrespect whatsoever to the leadership of the, is the revolution in Iran. Imam Khomeini and all those who fought the regime of the Shah with such matchless courage. I honor them and I respect them and I'll never say anything hurtful about them. Can you please give an example of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam about how he established the Khilafah? You have to take control of territory. Either exclusive control, that is you alone control, or on the basis of a, an agreement in which you share, you share control over the territory with others. The Mithaq of Medina was an agreement, a constitutional agreement, in which Muslims shared control over territory with those who are not Muslims. The 
ruler who rules over the Muslims in that territory would be the Khalifa over, over the Muslims. That was called a plural model of a state. But that plural model of a state only lasted for a short time. And then the Jews betrayed the Treaty of Medina and they were expelled. And now you have the exclusive model. When Muslims take control of a territory in the name of Islam and establish Allah's law in that territory, there will be one Jama'ah and one Amir. That Amir, on the condition that he controls the Haramain and the Hajj, would now be the, khila, the Khalifa. What is the role of Freemasons in the globalization subject? The Freemasons are an organization which have their roots in ancient Israel. <coughs> Banu Israel from the earliest times. The Freemasonry movement, however, was hijacked by the Europeans who put on the clothing of Judaism. European Jew. Yes, Sheikh Sadi, here we are. This is something for you. Oh, no. It's a gift. <laughs> the, the Freemasonry now has been hijacked by them and they're using it as a front organization so that they can stand behind. So you attack World Trade Center, but your fingerprints are not on the crime. Hmm? You're behind. You attack the full World Trade Center in 1991 and you put Sheikh Omar Abdurrahman behind bars, the, the blind Sheikh. But the Jewish fingerprints are not on the crime. You attack the U.S. A, a mission in Tanzania, the U.S. mission in Kenya, uh, um, Tanzania and Kenya, and you believe that we are blind. We know you did it. You attacked. But you blame Osama bin Laden for that. But guess what? One day, one day, Yawma Idhin, to haddithu akhbaraha. Bi anna rabbaka awhalaha. One day the earth will speak. And all your lies are now going to be exposed. And on that day we will have confirmation for what we now suspect. Mm -hmm. What role does the economic boycott of Israel and some American companies have on the return of the Khilafah? It is something that the Muslim com community should be taking seriously. Strange people, Muslims. What they should not be doing, that's what they're doing. And what they should be doing, that not, they don't do not it. Never in our entire history as a people have we ever used trade as a weapon. Never. Never. It is our enemies who use trade as a weapon against us in Medina. Mm -hmm. An economic boycott against us which lasted three years. Did we ever reply and respond with an economic boycott of our own? No, we never did. Why? لا تأكلوا أموالكم بينكم بالباطل إلا أن تكون Trade should be conducted in such a way that there is mutual benefit, says the Quran. So when you impose an economic boycott on somebody, you're hurting yourself. You're allowed to trade with your enemy. Because in trade there is mutual benefit. The only thing that is prohibited is to trade with the enemy at times of war, in weapons of war. That is prohibited. So an economic boycott on the United States of America and you're not going to drink Coca-Cola, well you should not have been drinking it in the first place. Water is better than Coca-Cola. But leave that aside. We've never had an economic boycott in our own his entire history. This is the first time I've ever heard of an economic boycott. I know about Ronald, Ronald Reagan and his economic boycott on the Soviet Union, but not Islam. No. So from my perspective, it is wrong to engage 
in the use of trade as a weapon against anyone. Right, inshallah, Sheikh Shadi is here and he'll take on that subject of the detention center in Shafra. What happened to the army from Isfahan? I know about the army from Khorasan. The hadith is that when Dajjal attacks Damascus and the Imam is inside the masjid and Dajjal is outside, Dajjal will be followed by 70,000 Jews from Isfahan wearing their Jewish shawls. That is the hadith. What this hadith indicates is that the state of Israel would no longer be ruled at that time by the European Jews, but that rather Banu Israel, who today are second-class citizens in Israel, they call them the Arab Jews. <laughs> Banu Israel would have taken over the state of Israel from the European Jews. But this has already started. Where's the evidence? The evidence is that last year sometime there was the election for the presidency. I think it was last year. And the European Jews put up the prince himself. Who is he? Shimon Perez. The prince himself of the European Jews. And Banu Israel, the Arab Jews, or the Sephardic Jews as they're called now, they put up a, a person whose name nobody ever heard before. Moshe Katsov or something like that. And guess what? Katsov is an Iranian Jew. And he defeated, defeated um, Shimon Peres, and he's now the president of the state of Israel. For the first time in his history, an important post in the government of Israel is held by a non European Jew. It's the beginning of the process which will eventually fulfill this hadith that Dajjal will be followed by 70,000 Jews from Isfahan wearing their Jewish shawls. What do you think will replace paper money in the future? Come for my lecture next Wednesday, inshallah. Gog and Magog have freed from between the Caucasus mountains, would these people be Caucasian people? The, the uh, Khalifa sent an army sometime around the year 50 Hijri. Sorry, not an army. This is in all the books of Tafsir. He sent an expedition to try and locate that barrier which was built by Zulkarnain. That expedition returned with the news that they located the barrier. And it was lying in ruins. So if you're waiting for Gog and Magog to come sometime in the future, brother, keep waiting. The barrier is lying in ruins. And companions of the Prophet Muhammad they self, themselves gave the testimony that they went and saw with their own eyes. They located the barrier and it was lying in ruins. Where was it located? In a pass between the Caucasus Mountains. So when you hear the term white Caucasian male, there's something behind that to look into. White Caucasian male. How deep and what sort of oppression do you expect during the interim period when Israel becomes the ruling state in the world? This is where you must help me. I am doing what is called a structural thought, macro thought, all right? Concentrating on the macro image. And I praise and thank Allah who has helped me with it. But the micro thought is where you can now come in because you've got the talent. And you can send me an email now to help me. That look, at the micro level, this is what we can now expect when Israel becomes the ruling state. This is what we can expect, expect politically. This is what we can expect in terms of the economy. This is what we can expect in terms of monetary problems. 
Okay? And as you send me your emails with this microanalysis that you are doing, as I lecture around the world, I can be benefited from it and I can pass this on to others. But I am not, I am not in a position to devote my time and thought to this microanalysis because I'm still working on the macroanalysis. Please correct my information. I thought that the United States joined World War II because of the attack on Pearl Harbor, but of course that's correct. Whoever doubted that? I never, I never said anything in conflict with this. We're talking about the United States joining First World War, not Second World War. If we have to wait for Imam Mahdi to ensure that all of Islam is completely implemented, then what do we do about our brothers and sisters being slaughtered around the Muslim world? The Rasul alayhi salatu waslam said that the Imam is a shield in which he protects and they, are right, they fight behind him. Surely we must implement the leader first in order to protect the Muslims. I said that the jihad is already in force in the Holy Land. We don't need a fatwa from anyone. And I said that no one can stop this jihad, not in Oslo or not in downtown Washington. This jihad will continue until the Holy Land is liberated. But we engage in this jihad with the absolute assurance of the victory that will come. There is absolutely no doubt at all that this jihad is going to be successful. Secondly, the jihad to liberate Khorasan, because it is from there the army will come, which will liberate the Holy Land. That jihad is already in force. And we already have, alhamdulillah, we already have shuhada, who must be smiling and joyfully exist, uh, happiness in heaven now. Elsewhere in the world, however, if you engage in offensive jihad, not defensive. Defensive jihad is when you are being attacked and your wife is being raped and your children are being slaughtered. You fight. It is better to die as a man than to live as a rat. So anytime you are being attacked and you have no room for a strategic retreat, none. You are cornered, you fight. If it is possible for you to retreat, you must retreat. However, offensive jihad, for the purpose of liberating territory, for the purpose of establishing Allah's rule on earth, that, I said, is not possible anywhere on the face of the earth today. But I also said, if, listen, I wish I could repeat it a thousand times, if you defer with me, who is stopping you from launching your struggle, your revolutionary struggle to liberate Australia and establish the Islamic State in Australia? Who is stopping you? I'm not stopping you. If you feel that this can be done, go ahead and do it. I am saying you'll be, fail you'll be a failure. You'll be destroyed. But this is on the, on the basis of my understanding that the world order in which we live today is the world order of Ya'juj and Ma'juj. You do not share this with me, and you feel that it is possible to wage a revolutionary struggle to establish the Islamic State anywhere on the face of the earth, please go ahead and do it. Upon the death of a Khalifa, this is the hadith I was quoting. Same hadith he's quoted here. And he asks, does this hadith not indicate that the Khilafah will be restored before the return of the Mahdi? But this is the hadith on the Mahdi. Upon the death of a Khalifa, people will defer upon themselves. Then a man from the people of Medina will flee to Mecca. People from Mecca will approach him and give him the bay'ah while he dislikes it. This is not in Sahih Muslim. The bay'ah will be given to him between the Rukun and Maqam, near the Kaaba. He will divide the wealth among the Muslims justly and implement upon the people of the Sunnah of their Prophet. Islam will spread on the earth. 
he'll be for seven years and then he'll die and the Muslims will pray upon him. Who is this man? Who is this man? Imam al Mahdi. This is Imam al Mahdi. Yes. All right. Thank you very much. One Islam Productions, an Islamic film studio established in Australia, is dedicated to producing films for all Muslims. Just some of the films by One Islam Productions. Children's programs, Islam for Me, We Remember Allah, Storytime and more. Educational films, Pray As You Have and Seen Me Pray, Words, Ramadan, Renewal Next. of Faith. Documentaries. We at One Islam Productions believe that Islam is precious and deserves to be presented in only the highest quality. Visit us at www.oneislam.net for more information. One Islam Productions, a film production company run by Muslims for Muslims.